This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the uh, fourth NERSC uh, Nobel uh, lecture keynote talk, and uh, uh, we've had great attendance at all, all, all four, and this is actually setting a record. And each one, we've, made, we've streamed these uh, online, and each one has had more and more online viewers as well. So the last one had 250. Uh, given how many people are here, my guess is this will, this will set our record. Uh, so I, th I think if we had another another uh, another few Nobel prizes, we wouldn't. I don't know where we'd hold it. So, <laughs> so it's a good thing this is. Uh, we only have four in the last uh, 18 years. Uh, so I wanted to thank Professor Perlmutter. He's an astrophysicist at Berkeley Lab and a professor of physics at UC Berkeley, who is known worldwide for his groundbreaking contributions to improving our understanding of the evolution of the universe since the Big Bang. He heads the lab's Supernova Cosmology Project, which in 1998 discovered that galaxies are receding from one another faster now than they were billions of years ago, a finding that, Ned, uh, that led to a Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, Professor Perlmutter shared the 2011 uh, Nobel Prize with uh, Brian Schmidt and Aunt Adam Rees for their concurrent discovery that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate overturning the conventional notion that universe's expansion is slowing. Both teams reached this conclusion by observing distant exploding stars known as type 1A supernova. These same research efforts uh, garnered uh, Professor Perlmutter and, and Reese the 2006 Shaw Prize in astronomy, uh, and Professor Perlmutter and Schmidt the 2007 Gruber Cosmology Prize. Uh, over the years, Professor Perlmutter has uh, received numerous additional awards, such as the 2002 E.O. Lawrence Award, the 2003 California Scientist of the Year Award, uh, the 2005 John Scott Award, uh, and in 2011, uh, Professor Perlmutter and Reese were co-recipients of the Albert Einstein Medal. Uh, in addition to his work in the Supernova Cosmology Project, Professor Perlmutter is a lead investigator for the Supernova Acceleration Probe Project, uh, which aims to build a satellite de dedicated to finding and studying more supernova in di the distant universe. He is also a participant in the Berkeley Earth Science Temperature Project, which aims to increase our understanding of global warming through improved analyses of climate data. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Professor Perlman. So I can hear Well, good, uh, good afternoon. Oh, a little echoey. Should we turn down a tiny bit? Is it a, okay. So um, it's a pleasure to be uh, here to help celebrate the, the 40th anniversary of, of, uh, of NERSC. Um, and I, I was, when I was asked to give the talk, I immediately was uh, starting to describe all the uh, things that I thought would be fun to, to, to you know, think about in terms of what happened with NERSC and what happened with uh, the work we'd done. But then um, I, in discussion, we started realizing that, or I was told, that uh, I had to assume that uh, at least a large fraction of the audience wouldn't actually know what it was that the science that we did that uh, led to the acceleration of the universe, um, how it was done. And so I was put in that slightly awkward position of realizing that in a home you know, audience of this sort, um, many people will um, have heard me speak before, um, and yet um, many people won't. So what I thought I would try to take advantage of is the fact that um, I've been, over the years, arguing that the understanding of how it is that we understand that the universe is, is accelerating, how, how we managed to make that measurement, is something that you can explain very easily. And it's one of the few very fundamental um, aspects of science that I know of that you can explain easily. And so since I've been making the case that everybody should be in a position, in fact, I you know, think 
anybody in the entire country should be in a position of being able to explain this at home to their, you know, to their family members. You know, it's basically a bedtime story to your child. Um, <laughs> that I, th I thought that um, for those of you who've heard it before, I would just give you a recap. Um, so that you would then you know, be able to practice again, so you get this right you know, so when, you, when you come back. And for those who haven't heard it before, this will be your first round, and you can tell me whether it works tonight when you put your child to bed. Um, OK, so the, uh, the story um, that, uh, that, that I'm calling Data Computation the Fate of the Universe begins then with a quick recap of the Fate of the Universe part of the story, and then I'll, I'll move back to, the, uh, to the, you know, where we, we go from there. Um, the story that you want to tell uh, at, at, you know, at night um, begins you know, uh, nicely enough um, with the idea that the uh, very first humans must have found themselves asking these very deep questions when they looked out at the sky at night. Um, and, I, and I've been saying that I think this is really what it means to be human, that you would find yourself looking at the stars and find yourself wondering whether it goes on forever spatially and whether it will last forever in time. And that the very deep fundamental question of that kind um, couldn't really be approached in many, in many rigorous way until um, just this past century when Einstein put down uh, the, his theory of general relativity and he came up with concepts that allowed him to ask mathematically rigorous questions about the universe that we live in. He immediately ran into a problem, this is uh, from the summer of 1917 when he started working on this, that the universe um, that he was calculating could either be collapsing in or it could be expanding out. And as far as he knew, um, and as far as everybody, uh, scientists around him knew, we live in a static universe that wasn't changing. So he put in a fudge factor, something that you know, most of us have been tempted to do at some point in our, in our lives um, in a, in a you know, physics course. And when Einstein puts a fudge factor in, it sounds better than when most of us do it, because he calls it you know, the cosmological constant, and he gives it the Greek variable lambda. And it's all great, except it's not wonderful. It sort of makes a universe that kind of barely teeters on, on standing still. And it was only a dozen years later that he kicked himself and he called it his greatest blunder for putting in that fudge factor because that's when Hubble and colleagues uh, measured the, uh, well, did measurements and discovered that the universe really was expanding. And, and so uh, we, we now believe that the universe um, that we live in is an expanding universe. And Einstein you know, blew it. He, he could have he uh, you know, seen this coming. Um, now, uh, what? You should, at this point, find um, your, your, your child uh, saying to you at, the, at, at this moment when you're trying to explain this, this part of the story is that that's ridiculous. What do you mean that the, the universe is, is expanding? Um, you know, I thought the universe is everything. What could, a, what could you be expanding into if the universe is expanding? And this is you know, the obvious question that comes to, to, in everybody's minds. So this next part of the story is going to be the crucial part um, whenever, you tell this, whenever you explain to anybody, um, which is the part that I'd say three quarters of the questions they ask you afterwards will all come back to the same point, which is that the universe that we're imagining here isn't a universe that is somehow a real explosion that's expanding into something else. I mean, you're supposed to use the somewhat, well, a, let me try the simplest version of the story. Now, it's still mind boggling, but it's as simple as I, as I think you can start with. And this is an idea that we live in a, perhaps today, in an infinite universe. And you then have this problem that you can't draw an infinite universe. So you're you know, supposed to imagine that these are all galaxies, but that now you know, they go on forever um, up and down and into the screen and out to you. And it's just an infinite universe. It goes on and on forever. That's already kind of mind-boggling, I, I agree, at least though it's consistent. It's not, you know, you're not saying weird things about things going, you know, exploding into some space that is not universe. So, um, so that's OK. So you have an infinite universe. Then comes the big trick which is that when you say the universe is expanding, all you really mean is that all the distances between those, the average distance between those galaxies, it just gets a little bit bigger. And that's all we mean by an expanding universe. So it could be infinite now. It could be infinite in the future. The only difference is that there's a little bit more distance between every galaxy. And so when the universe expands, it doesn't expand into anything. If anything, you're sort of just puffing extra space in between the galaxies. And so, all right, it's still bizarre, but at least it's consistent. And that's the, and, and, I, and if you can get that picture in, into, into your you know, family member's mind, uh, that, you know, that's the one that I think will help understand the rest of, this, of the discussion. So now you have uh, something different to be thinking about, and Einstein now had a, gave us a different picture at this stage, which is that now you're imagining a universe that's actually changing in time. And so you find yourself asking things like, well, if it's expanding, um, is it going to keep on expanding? And wouldn't, I don't know, wouldn't all the gravity of uh, you know, traction between all these different galaxies, wouldn't that sort of slow the expansion? And 
that's something that you can now actually take that, what seemed like a very philosophical question, you can now take it and make it a, a practical measurement question because you can now say, well, why don't we go look back into the past and see how much the universe was slowing down before, and that might give us a hint as to what it's going to do in the future. To look into the past, though, is something that astronomers are really good at, and, uh, and, that, and, I'll, and I'll show you why. Um, in, and this actually began in uh, this particular work began in the 1980s when it was realized that there was a particular kind of exploding star, um, a particular type 1a supernova. Um, when, this one, uh, when a star explodes in a distant galaxy, um, it can be tremendously bright. And these type 1a's can be brighter than the entire galaxy of, oh, 100 billion stars that they explode in. Now, not for long. They just brighten in a few weeks and they fade away in, for, in a few months. But for just that peak brightness, um, they can be brighter than the entire galaxy of stars that they're seen in. That means that you can see them very far away. And if you can see something very far away, um, that means, you're, in, in astronomy, um, that means that you're actually uh, seeing farther back in time. So here, when you're explaining this, I think you'll find that most of the people you're talking to, but maybe not your youngest children, will be aware that light takes time to travel. And even the ones who are aware that light takes time to travel, though, probably haven't really thought about how long it takes to travel across distances that you get to see in, in astronomical observations. So here you should start pointing out that uh, the light from the sun is, has been traveling to us for eight minutes. And, uh, and so you can say to them that you know, if the sun were to go out, there'd be no problem for eight minutes. Um, <laughs> the, Nearest star is more interesting. Uh, you know, we, we are orbiting around the sun four times um, while that light is traveling to us from that star. So we're not seeing it right now. We're seeing it as it was you know, four orbits around the, the sun ago uh, for us, four years ago. Um, but then once you get to the nearest galaxy of stars, now you're seeing this light from this galaxy that you, you, know, you look as if you're seeing it today. But really, you're seeing light that left um, 150,000 years ago. So here on Earth, when that light left, was, that's when we had the first evidence of human culture here on Earth. And the, that's still nothing compared to the nearest congregation of clusters of, uh, the, you know, clusters of galaxies. So you, if you look at groups of galaxies altogether, the nearest one of those clusters of galaxies is uh, far enough away that that light that you see here in this image, you know, these, actual, uh, these are galaxies here in this image, not stars. And, and the light from these has been traveling to us for 65 million years. So at the time when this light left that, that, that location, uh, we're seeing what it was like then um, when here on Earth the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, oh, OK, my, my extinct dinosaur, right. So, <laughs> but still, that's still nothing compared to how far away you can see um, with these very, very bright supernova. The, um, the furthest supernova that, uh, that we are seeing these days, um, the light has left this point some 10 billion years ago. And that's, I think, an amazing story to tell people, because you can uh, point out to them that there's just a bit of history. It lasted for just a couple weeks as this thing uh, brightened, and then a couple months as it faded away. And then that photon started traveling to us from you know, that very distant galaxy. And while it traveled to us, um, we had to take this, this bit of uh, you know, dust that was here and congregate it into a solar system. Um, there was no solar system at that time. Uh, the stars, you know, the, the sun had to, to form out of that. The uh, planets had to form. We had to, oh, you know, start some primordial soup going so that you could get some, uh, you know, some uh, single cell organisms. They had to evolve um, to, you know, basically eventually get out of the, uh, the, the, the water and onto land. Um, we had to evolve. We had to figure out how to build telescopes. Um, we had to build a really, really big telescope. In fact, the, the particular one that we needed to, to observe that um, we, was designed to, uh, one flight up here, um, the Keck telescope. And then we had to go um, construct it, get it uh, all tuned up, and then swing it over and point it just in time for that photon to come in <laughs> 10 billion years later and, and you catch it on, this, uh, you know, on, on your detector. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really just in time work, you know, to. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So 10 billion years later, we now get to see a tiny bit of history from, from that period, which I, I, I just think is just a, a great story to be able to tell. Um, but this is really actually very useful, because now um, we wanted to know about how the history of the expansion of the universe um, will tell us about the eventual phase of the universe. What has it been doing, and what will that predict for what comes up? So the, uh, what we want to use, then, is the fact that these supernova not only can be seen very far away, but they can, you can even tell how far away they are, because the 
particular kind of supernova we're describing, these type 1As, always brighten to the same brightness and then start to fade away. And so approximately the same brightness. And so you can treat them a little bit as uh, what an astronomer calls a standard candle. The further away you go with a standard candle, if you walked across the room, the fainter it would look. And you can just measure how far away somebody had gotten by how bright that candle appeared. Similarly, the supernova, you can tell how far away it is by how bright it is. And then you know how long it takes for the light to reach us, because you know the speed of light. So every individual supernova just tells you, um, just by its brightness at its peak, um, how far back in time that particular explosion occurred. And now that's really convenient. But there's one other thing you'd like to know about that particular moment in time. You'd like to know how much has the universe expanded since that time. And the supernova, once again, um, managed to tell you that, because the light from a supernova, um, if, you're, if you're able to stand right next to it and you know, not die, um, it would look most look mostly blue. So that's a, a, a short wavelength of light. Then that light has to travel through the universe, but the universe is stretching while it travels. And in an ex expanding universe, as I was just describing to you, anything that's not nailed down stretches just with the universe. And that includes that very photon of light. So by the time it reaches us, it looks uh, much redder. And you can just read off from that red shift, as we call it, um, how much the universe has stretched since that particular date when that particular supernova exploded. So that is really convenient. Um, it, you, know, we, you get this amazing trick that you know, the redshift is just allowing you to read off the stretch of the universe since any individual supernova explosion. And uh, if you put this together then, and as you tell the story, um, you can say, OK, so in some distant galaxy over here, a supernova explodes. It looks blue. It starts to travel to us in an expanding universe. And while it travels, it gets redder and redder, just as the universe stretches, until it reaches us. And you read off by how red it looks, exactly how much the universe has stretched. And that's the entire story you need to tell. And then your child can go to sleep. And <laughs> okay. so, but, but they may want to know what, what, what we did with that and, how, and, and you know, how, it all, how it all came out in the end. You know, what was the answer to the story? So the, um, the story uh, at this point becomes just a little bit um, harder to actually do in fact than it sounds like in that nice cartoon. because. Now what you really want to do is you want to find the whole series of supernova uh, representing different moments in history. So you find one supernova that's pretty faint. You know, maybe it's a, you know, a billion years um, that the light's been traveling to us. Um, and so it tells you how much the universe stretched from a billion years ago. You find another supernova that's fainter. So maybe it's uh, been the light's traveling to us for 4 billion years. And you can read off from it how much the universe has stretched since 4 billion years ago. Another one, you know, maybe 7 billion years back. And you could plot out the history then of the expansion of the universe using the supernova if you can find those supernova. And that was um, where we were back in the 1980s when we realized that you could do this uh, in principle, but we had not yet figured out how to find these very distant supernova. The problem partly is the fact that supernova are a real pain in the neck to work with. They, uh, they only explode a couple times per millennium. You know, there's only so long you're going to have your grad students. The, <laughs> they don't warn you ahead of time when they're going to explode. So you know that, it, it, and and also they they well, even when, and once they explode, you know they brighten in a few weeks and they and they're gone. So if you need to um, use the the largest uh, telescopes, let me see if I have no, not here. Oh, if you need to use the largest telescopes in the world to to observe something like this, um, you have to write proposals six months in advance. And so it really didn't work to write proposals, you know, saying. I want the night of March the 3rd, you only get one night you know, if, you, if you propose, um, just in case the supernova explodes in the next couple hundred years. Um, and so early on, then the, the main name of the game was trying to figure out how to turn this into a more systematic, you know, manageable project. What we ended up doing was uh, developing um, uh, these optical systems that would allow us to take a fairly wide field of, of uh, sky and observe it and uh, bring it down to a small CCD chip. And uh, for those of you who've wondered what that sort of round bit of glass is sitting in the front hall um, of this building, that was the, uh, the original instrument that we built, um, the original optics that we built to, uh, to take a wide field and bring it down onto a small CCD camera chip. Um, if you do that, now you can get hundreds and then thousands of galaxies in a single night. And the, in an image like this, you should ignore all the beautiful bright things in the front. Because what you're looking for now are supernova exploding in these little faint blue specks in the background. These are all distant galaxies, um, all these little blue specks. And those are the things that we were going to try to find supernova in. So the next job clearly, finally now, brings me back to um, the, uh, the topic of today, which is computing. 
because uh, clearly this was not a job, once more, for even your most patient graduate student to look through those thousands of blue specks and try and find this little extra bit of light on top of the blue speck that represents the, the supernova explosion that you see in a later image. And so we ended up, over the years, developing um, it's many generations of computer software that would allow the computer to compare the images and then home in for us on the spot right over there, for example, where if you blow it up, you can see that this area is brighter than that one. So here's the galaxy without supernova, here's the galaxy with supernova, and if you subtract this image from three weeks before from this image when the supernova was up, you get just the difference, which is the light from the supernova. So that was a lot of work in the early days to try and get to the point that we could uh, make, have the, the computers go through these, what at the time was vast amount of data, um, and find the supernova within, ideally, a, a few hours of the observation. So then we could go follow it, because you need to remember to measure it as it brightened and faded to get that peak brightness that you were using as your standard candle. So this was uh, done in around, oh, well, we thought it was going to be a really hard project. We started. I uh, think it was going to take us three years um, to, to do the whole thing and find you know, a series of supernova. After three years, we hadn't found any supernova. After four or five years, we had our first supernova. Um, six years long, I think we, had our, we demonstrated that we could do this in a standardized way, and we started semester after semester um, going, applying for time and going to the, all the telescopes around the world because we needed to use like four or five of them to get uh, good quality measurements of these, of these sorts. Um, Oh, and, and eventually also using the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, where you can see the light from in space uh, allows you to pick out the supernovas, that little white dot from the background galaxy, whereas in the ground they're all uh, blurred together. Um, and we, uh, every semester then, we would start to bring in half a dozen to a dozen supernova um, of this kind, until in uh, 97 we were finally had enough supernova in hand that we were ready to make a plot of the fate of the universe, as we may imagine the average distance between galaxies as a function of time. And uh, we were rather excited. We had 42 supernova in hand. For those who've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it seemed an auspicious number. For those who, <laughs> for those who didn't, you, you can ask your friends later. Um, the, and the options were just great, because one option would be that you'd find that the universe was slowing but going on forever. Um, that would look a little bit like this if you were lying on your back and you had telescopes for eyes, I guess. Now, the universe expands away from each other, away from you, but it slows and slows, but it keeps on going uh, forever. So that was option one. Option two, um, the universe has enough mass in it, enough density, that it slows to a halt, and then it collapses. Um, so that one is a little bit more exciting, because it begins the same. It slows and slows, just like the other one. But this one, it slows and then it turns around, and it starts coming back in. And around this point, you start getting nervous. And <laughs> And, and this universe comes to an end, and, and that was great. I mean, what could be better than to have a project where you go out, you just make the measurement of the brightness and spectra and colors of, of some uh, little specks of, in the sky, and just doing that simple measurement, you get to find out, do we live in a universe that's going to come to an end? Um, and so this, this was, you know, it was the best project I could imagine. In fact, it was even better because it turned out at that time with this particular model of the universe we had, that if we, uh, if it did not come to an end, that meant that we were on one of these universes, which um, was a way of, of uh, measuring that we live in an infinite universe. And uh, you know, some other, maybe if we time of questions, I can explain what it would mean if we did not live in an infinite universe. But that was, uh, you know, I figured, what could be better? Either we measure that the universe is infinite, or we measure that the universe is going to come to an end. We were doing this just before the millennium, so we thought that we could you know, walk around with a sign saying the universe is coming to an end or not, you know, uh, <laughs> just in time. So, uh, so it, was, it was really great. And, then, of course, what happened was um, when we put the points on this plot, what we got was that, right? So that was the, the, the surprise that you've heard about and that, you know, at, at the time um, really made us assume that we made some mistake, right? And so we spent a lot of time working on it. This means that the universe is not slowing down at all. It's going faster and faster. In fact, pretty soon it just whoosh. Um, everything will be gone. Um, you have to do all your astronomy now. I've been pointing out to the funding agencies. Um, so, but it doesn't, they don't, they don't seem to care. In a few, well, so in a few billion years, you won't be able to see any, anything else. Um, and the data, um, when, you, when you look at it on a real graph, uh, you know, with real you know, error bars, um, you know, it show, looks like this. You have uh, the nearby examples where the brightness of the supernova tells you how far away it is and hence how far back in time you're looking. This is today, and you're looking back in time. The redshift. The blue ones, you know, if there's no redshift, 
and then it gets redder and redder as you see more and more stretching as you go back in time compared to further back in time. Um, and then, of course, the data that we found missed all the lines we expected. And apparently, we live in a universe that was decelerating for the first half of its life and then started accelerating for the last half of its life. And so that was what the actual data looked like at, the, at that time. Um, now, the conclusion of this story um, is, you know, at this point, you have to tell um, your, you know, your child, who I think, I hope by now has sat up in bed, you know, to, to, to listen to this part. Um, you have to tell them that we do not know, uh, oh, and I should, I should say that, by the way, this is a very good Berkeley story, because while we were analyzing our data up here at um, LBL, um, down on campus, the, at that point, we had now had a rival team, and they were ra racing with us. They were analyzing their data just at the same time, and we were seeing the surprise um, simultaneously. And of course, it wasn't just uh, these, you know, the, the two, uh, th these two people. It was you know, the group leader in Australia. It was the entire um, two t international teams um, who were uh, who really struck by that. And that th these were the teams that all came out to Sweden, um, to Stockholm, um, in, in uh, 2012. So, so th th that's, th that was a great example of a group, pro group project where the two groups together actually represented a, a very large fraction of the whole community that works on supernova. So it, it really ended up being a sort of community effort that led to this result, which I think is just a fun, uh, uh, you know, a fun side of the story. Um, now, you at this point, as I was saying, you have to admit cheerfully to, um, your, to your child who you're explaining this to that, uh, that we have no idea why the universe is accelerating, because they will immediately ask why, of course. And the uh, term we use, dark energy, is a term just to reflect the uh, placeholder of, of what it would take in the form of an energy that, you pre that would have to be spread throughout all space um, that could explain an acceleration of this kind. And if it really is, in the end, this new form of energy that we haven't yet explored, then most of the stuff of the universe is made out of it, almost 3 quarters. So that's really striking. Now, it could be even, I know, more dramatic than that. I, I don't know if it's more dramatic. Um, it may be that we haven't quite gotten Einstein's theory of general relativity right. Maybe there's some extra part in the story of gravity that we'll, that we'll have to learn. And so the, now the race is on to try to understand this. Now, of course, the people who really lead this kind of race are the theorists. And <laughs> The theorists went to, went, have been at work hard um, ever since the discovery. Um, in fact, since, that, uh, since this, uh, the original announcement back in 98, um, there has been an average of a paper written, published uh, in a journal um, every 24 hours um, <laughs> since, since that time. And they come up with great names for these theories. So uh, you know, you, I, I think everybody will love telling your friends that you know, you're, you're talking here about the phantom energy or the you know, big rip cosmology, or if you can pronounce it, the ekpyrotic universe. But um, I, it's also fair to say that none of these theorists um, will, at the moment, stand behind their, their theory. Not, <laughs> now, not because they think there's anything wrong with what they, what they wrote, but because um, they, they're trying to broaden the range of possibilities of what's going on. And really, they, put, they say the ball's back in our court to help home de you know, hone in on one or the other of these ranges of theories. And it's, it's now the job of the experimentalists, the observers, to find out more about the properties of this acceleration, the properties of this dark energy, um, so that we have a fighting chance to understand um, what, could be, uh, what could be explaining it. Um, we, people have not been just sitting around for the past uh, you know, uh, what is it now, 14 years, um, the, uh, the supernova data has gotten dramatically better. So originally, the, you know, this small sample of less than 50 supernova um, has now, well, here, let me turn this around and flip it upside down the way the astronomers like to look at it. Um, it's, it's now gotten to be over 700 supernova. Every one of these 700 supernova is better measured than any of those first uh, 42 supernova that I just mentioned to you. Um, so it's, uh, there's been a tremendous advance in, in our, in our um, understanding of this expansion history of the universe um, in that sense. However, um, it's fair to say that we, had, no, we still do not constrain the behavior of the dark energy in any way that really helps us. Uh, this is a, a plot of what we call the dark energy equation of state, um, which is you can think of it as sort of the springiness of the dark energy in terms of how it wants the universe to accelerate um, as a function of looking back in time for the, the higher redshift. And really, it's only at very recent times that we have a very tight measurement at all. As soon as you get a little bit further back in time, these are very loose constraints, and they could con con conclude almost anything, including things that aren't dark energy at all. So we don't know much about what's causing the acceleration yet. Um, 
in, in that sense. And if you ask, well, why not? You know, 700 supernova, it sounds great. Um, the answer is that the measurements uh, that, that have to be much, much better um, in order to be able to, make, to, to get at the differences between the theories. So the current range of, uh, so, so you can see the data has gone from this to something like this, but the all theories are all within the thickness of this green line. So you need to be able to look for little changes in, of, of that history that are all w hidden inside the thickness of that line. And so that means a factor of some 20 of improvement of, of uh, the the uncertainties in the measurement. Um, now, I think we have a fighting chance to do that because we now know a lot about all the steps that the light takes as it comes to us from the um, exploding supernova, and we know much more about the supernova themselves. And so uh, we can, you know, for example, the uh, simulations that are done on, and this is once more tying back to where I'm going to get to with the, uh, with the uh, you know, NERSC and the computers. So these are um, supercomputer calculations done at NERSC where you can measure Actually, let me see if I can get this to animate. Ah, so we have a, uh, all right. Well, this is a nice animation, by the way, if you see it sometimes. <laughs> um, you, you can see the, um, as you go deeper and deeper into the atmosphere of a exploding star, you can see the spectrum change. This is based on uh, uh, supercomputer calculations done here at, at NERSC. Um, and so we have a, a, a very um, detailed, uh, you know, story of, of, of what the um, different elements are and what's going on in the supernova that you can then use to match supernova at high redshift to low redshift if you can get very detailed spectra of the supernova at every different distance. And it looks now as if we have a, a fighting chance to get those kinds of detailed spectra because the, uh, the mention of that satellite uh, project I, that I actually was working on with many people here at, at the lab called, was originally called the SNAP satellite, Supernova Acceleration Probe. Um, over the years, uh, that morphed into a project called JDAM, which was a joint dark energy mission um, that DOE and NASA was doing together, until eventually it morphed into a, uh, a project that's now called WFIRST, which is Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. And uh, I'm finally getting optimistic that we may have a chance that this is actually going to happen, um, because it uh, looks now as if the, uh, all the stars are, you know, are, are aligned. <laughs> And, and, we, and we may actually um, uh, uh, you know, get a chance to make this measure, to have a telescope now that can make the measurements of the supernova that I showed you um, all the way out to some 10 billion years back, but with the kind of detail and precision that we've only seen in very, very nearby supernova up till now. So that is, uh, I think, a very exciting uh, opportunity for us to do that supernova measurement at that level of precision that we want. Um, but it's not just supernova that we have in, in, uh, in, uh, as now over these last decade or so. Um, we've developed a couple of other techniques. And um, so supernova takes you from the standard candle seen nearby, and you go backwards, back in time, by uh, comparing more distant supernova to more nearby ones. There's another uh, technique now on the table that has actually made a measurement on this kind of plot, um, which is the barren acoustic oscillation measurement that goes forward in time from the glow left over from the Big Bang, the Cosmic Bikeway background. And uh, I'll just say a word or two about that one, because that's also something that's being led here at Berkeley, and it's also something that we use the, uh, the computing facilities here uh, to, to accomplish. Um, if you uh, look at that leftover glow from the Big Bang, you'll see the, the sort of hotter spots and colder spots. The hotter spots represent places where things are more dense back in the very primordial soup days. Um, and the uh, they represent spots that are where those density, I'm sorry, the density tells you where galaxies are eventually going to form. So if you then go forward in time and see where do the galaxies actually show up, the typical distance between the, density, the dense spots that you see in the cosmic ray background um, blows up to be the typical distance between the galaxies in the expanded universe. So you now want to just measure the distances uh, and the locations of each shell of galaxies as the universe expands. And it's another way of measuring that expansion history of the universe by going forward in time. Now, this is something that the uh, a team here at Berkeley um, has been leading a large international collaboration called BOSS. And they've now done these kinds of measurements at several different redshifts. At, uh, and this is a level of precision that is you know, striking. It's really um, amazing. So at redshift 0.57 and redshift 2.3, there are now uh, measurements of you know, what is the average distance, this typical distance um, between these uh, overdense spots in, on the, in the universe. And that leads us to 
points on this same um, expansion history, and uh, those are shown here in green um, from this project boss. And the great thing about this technique is, well, first of all, it's the first time we've had something else besides supernova on a plot like this. But second of all, it's a technique that you can take much further. And so the, uh, there's a project now that we're hoping is about to go ahead called DESI, um, Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, um, which if you uh, take seriously um, the data that you should be able to get from that project, those are these red points on this graph. And, uh, and oh, actually, I don't have the blow up here in this one. And this has enough precision in it that you can trace amazing detail in the expansion of the universe. So between the W first doing the supernova at this high level precision and DESI doing the BAO at this high level precision, we really should have nailed the expansion history of the universe um, by the, well now, the uh, DESI and, uh, and the W first are both expected that we'd have the data coming up in around the 2020s. Um, so uh, it's, you know, you probably should not you know, wait around uh, this afternoon, but I'm hoping that with, within the not too distant future, we may actually have data that could tell us something about um, what are the properties of this, uh, of this you know, dark energy. Um, and uh, the, there are the, the question of uh, also, it's being a change in gravity is something that you can also address using this other tech, the other techniques of measuring where the galaxies are in space. And so uh, that can be discussed. At, I'll get back to that some other time. Um, all right. So, I think what's interesting to point out here now in terms of today's context is that all of the story I've told you is amazingly computationally intensive. So the supernova work um, is, uh, you know, currently it, it takes on the order of about 1.5 terabytes per night that has to be processed. Um, the next generation of these large uh, telescopes that are being built to, to do the, uh, you know, both the ground-based one and space-based one I was telling you about, um, we'll be moving up to something more like 50 terabytes per night that you have to get through in time to be able to trigger on what, where the supernova are. We're using uh, you know, all sorts of uh, data science techniques like machine learning, boosted decision trees, to be able to pull out these rare transients, these supernova, from the haystack of all the million you know, candidates per night of things that look like they might change from one image to another. Then the supercomputer um, calculations then come back into simulating the supernova, so you can have a model to compare the supernova to and, uh, and be able to make some uh, extrapolations from what you're seeing. And you also need, um, and we've often used the, uh, the computer centers at NERSC and, and, uh, and that level of, of uh, large scale processing to do the statistical analysis of the cosmological parameters, because you have to, uh, to mock up many, many, many um, co copies of your experiment in order to get the statistics of what it is that you're, uh, that you're seeing. Now, that's just the supernova. The Bauer and acoustic oscillation uh, uh, techniques also have uh, been big users of the, of the uh, computing facilities. Um, in this case, the imaging survey uh, in 2025 is about 20 terabytes. Um, we'd expect that in, 2020, in 2025, it'll be 60 petabytes. And once more, um, you need to do very uh, sophisticated statistical analyses that do this, uh, this uh, Monte Carlos for the cross-correlation of the millions of galaxies um, so that you can collapse the problem to just these uh, two-point statistics on the sky of you know, average distances. Um, this depends, again, on comparisons to n-body simulations in how matter evolves in the universe. And so you know, once more, we're now looking at uh, projects that are limited by um, how many particles um, you can mimic in a, in a simulation. And uh, the current state of art is these you know, so 2048 cubed to 4096 cubed. And in principle, we would like to see at least an order of magnitude more to get down to the scale um, that you'd like to be able to simulating to test these techniques that we're, that we're using that show where the galaxies evolve to. So these are uh, clearly um, pr fields that are limited by what we can do with computing at any given moment. And of course, the cosmic microwave background itself that is the, uh, you know, the, the basis for, um, for that technique that I was showing you, but also for much of our understanding of the fundamentals of the curvature of space itself. Um, that there, it's always been a matter of, the, of chasing the uh, fainter and fainter uh, measurements that you're trying to make. Um, and each time, the data is growing exponentially. So back in 2000, um, they were working with 10 to the 9 samples. Uh, this recent Planck result is 10 to the 12 samples. And the next generation that's being planned is, uh, would be something like 10 to the 15 um, that you need to be able to do this very complex cross-correlation of, once again, lots of Monte Carlos to understand the uncertainty quantification. Um, so this is 
there's no question that we're seeing big data you know, as the uh, limiting element. And in general, data science is limiting element of, of this field. Um, but it's not just cosmology, of course. You know, this is uh, just one of many fields now where this is how we do our job. That's how, how we do our work. And I think it's uh, interesting at this point to ask, um, given that you know, we do downstairs here, and you know, in Oakland it's going to be moved to the new site very soon over here, um, have uh, you know, huge amounts of computing available, and we're you know, getting good at what we do with it, um, you could ask what else is missing as we raise the ante and, uh, and, and increase our, our power of our computing. And so here, I want to bring in a, another side of the story that is probably not quite so obvious when we talk about um, these problems. It's not just a question that we need faster computers and better algorithms to use them. Um, there are these other aspects that just have to do with how humans and scientists work. And so I, I want to uh, describe a few of these here. First, we have this problem that today, so much of what we do as scientists with computing is reinventing things in every grad student who shows up, every scientist has to write code that, in many cases, is doing something that some other grad student or scientist has either somewhere else in the world been doing or somewhere even, their own, even in their own research group. Um, the next person coming along ends up finding that it's easier just to rewrite something from scratch than it is to use what was there before. Um, I think we need some way to not be working in this, in this uh, sort of morass of, of, uh, of things that are hard to find and hard to build on. And so I think that it would make a, you know, one of the huge advances in science will come when we figure out how better to make it possible to find already what's out there um, that you could build on and to be able to be contributing and maintaining code that could be useful for a larger community. So if we figure out a way to do that, I think that will actually revolutionize science in a, in a way that's not obvious um, you know, until you think about how much time we're spending trying to reinvent things that other people have already, already worked on. And we have also not solved some of these sociological problems, that we don't have good ways for people who are really expert in the computing side of the world um, to have a career when the group that they would ordinarily go with, in other words, the scientific team that they would work with, would identify them more as a computer expert, whereas the computer scientists would identify them more as a, you know, let's say, an astronomer. And so it's, it's right now we, we're in this funny position where some of the people that we need most in the sciences have no natural home in the academic uh, world that we, that we live in. And, uh, and, of course, we have the more just simple uh, uh, you know, problem that the training to do all these things is just sort of by hook or by crook. Often people learn their, their programming you know, on the job as they, as they need to, and you know, I would say that most of us don't learn the best practices if we're scientists. Um, and it, and it, this is clearly not the optimal way to be, to be trying to do something where the whole field is limited by so much of, of the computing that we need to do. Some less obvious things is that I think it's not just our, you know, the fault is not just in how we're training people. I think it's also in what it is that we're training them to use. Um, the programming languages and environments, I think, are still aimed more at what, it would, what you need if you're a programmer than what it is that you need if you're a scientist trying to deal with data and simulations. And I think that we could be developing much better environments uh, for those for, for, to actually do the science in so you're not distracted quite so much from the science you're trying to achieve and that you're actually able to focus on what it is that you're, the question is that you should be caring about next, not on do I need an extra little curly bracket here on the left you know, on, for, in this particular case. Um, Clearly, we're, there are lots of places where the interest and needs of the domain scientists, you know, the astronomers and the neurologists and, or the neuroscientists and the, you know, the uh, genetics uh, person, um, could be answered by, with the real help of, of something that's an interest and need of the methodologists, uh, the, you know, the statisticians, the uh, computer scientists. Often, they really will have solved something that is needed by the, the scientist. Um, but there's a, often a huge gap between what's ready coming out of the, you know, the th theoretical solution that a computer scientist has come up with and has demonstrated um, with one example, and what's really needed by the scientist to get the job done tomorrow. And we have to find ways to, to, to you know, get all the parts in between built. Um, and then finally, it's, it seems like we shouldn't assume that we already know the answers. We should be trying to use some ethnography tools to really see what it is that we're doing and where is it that we're stuck as scientists, and where is it that the connections aren't being made? 
And I think we could do much better by just a little bit of self-study as we, as we do all this. Um, and uh, I, so I think there's a lot of room for great gains. I mean, we could, you know, one of the fun aspects is that there is the possibility that we you know, bring people who have not yet been playing with uh, data science to answer questions. But there's this other fun um, side that you could actually have the chance of talking to people across all sorts of fields um, around these topics because so many people share similar problems nowadays in the in the you know in all ranges of science that when you get them together in the room and you start talking about a you know a, a computing problem that they're working on, um, they have actually a lot in common and at, at times might even be able to help each other in a field where ordinarily they'd never get a chance to play. So you know as a uh, cosmologist, you might get a chance to do a little bit of, you know, neuroscience um, uh, or vice versa. Um, all right. So with all this in mind, um, there has been some real new initiatives going on um, here at Berkeley. Uh, I was uh, very aware of this because we had started a, um, a uh, data science initiative in, for cosmology inside the Berkeley Center for Cosmological Physics. Um, this came from, uh, we had a, a donor um, that uh, gave us money for that. And then um, just uh, in this past year or so, um, there's been a large uh, uh, push from the Moore and Sloan Foundation that led, let Berkeley um, on campus start what we're calling the uh, Berkeley Institute for Data Science. And this is uh, now um, three universities were chosen, NYU, Berkeley, and UW, to try out this uh, you know, uh, $37 million cross-institutional collaboration for five years to see what can be done about these exact problems that I was, uh, I was just describing to you. Um, so there will be a center called uh, BIDS, Berkeley Institute for Data Science, that will live right in the middle of campus in the big grand library in the central, in central campus. Um, so it's ideally going to be a, a, a meeting place for people to come and solve problems together. And we hope that it will have a very close tie to the new efforts in this direction, including the new building that's just appearing uh, you know, just downhill here, um, here at the lab. And it, it feels like it's just a, the, the obvious time for these to come together. The lab itself is doing a big push on this uh, scientific data. Um, and there's this new initiative up here, um, which is being described as an uh, a, you know, extreme data science facility. Um, and the idea that you know, we obviously, at DOE in general, but uh, the lab also in particular, um, are, you know, we, we act as the home for so many different uh, large data collection um, projects that then turn into large data analysis projects that this is a, clearly a facility that is just you know, crying out uh, you know, to be built. Um, and so we're, we're optimistic that this will be one of the main homes for this for DOE, and uh, that we see it as a, a, a place where you, know, you can combine a lot of different elements all together um, in here, up at the lab, but then also um, working closely with campus. Um, all right, so let me leave time for questions. And, uh, but I also want to um, tell just the last little bit of history. So concluding this part, I, I, was, I hope it's clear that it's just a really exciting time in cosmology and that we're about to be ready to collect and simulate and analyze the next level of precision data. Um, I haven't focused quite on much, as much on the fact that um, everything I'm describing to you of all these next steps, I see as um, very likely to be leading us to the next surprises. I don't think we're finished with surprises in cosmology, and that's because cosmology is still a young field. Our first tries at an understanding of the universe have done amazingly well, but every time we make a measurement that is a significantly uh, more precise, significantly deeper, we're actually learning new surprises. So there's much more of the story I, I'm expecting that we'll still get to see in this next generation coming up. On the computing side, um, I want to say that's also a really exciting time, I think, for data sciences in, you know, for, for data science in for science, and that we're ready now to start exploring some new approaches. And there's much more to the high performance scientific computing than we've yet accomplished. So um, I'm very optimistic on this side as well. Now, as I was pulling all this story together, I was realizing that you know, here at Berkeley, and particularly at NERSC, we've really got a chance to witness you know, a lot of these changes occurring that I'm describing as uh, both the cosmology, but also the way that we use computing. And I was reminded that the very beginning of our supernova project, uh, when we first were working, um, we, were, you know, we were just working along with our best computer we could, you know, which was a PDP 1144 um, at, at that time. And I don't know how many people in the room will remember that if you were actually trying to handle things like images, 
Um, now that's you know, a, a, a tough thing in those days. Um, so we had these images from the CCDs, from the telescope, and if you're going to um, have images, it meant that your programming ended up being remarkably not fluent. Um, now you were using something that uh, there was the dreaded overlay. Um, so that meant that uh, you couldn't fit your entire program you know, and, and, and that in memory at one time. So you were constantly swapping in different parts of the program that were going to be able to fit into your computer at any given time. Now, this was really clumsy. And I see it as a metaphor for all these other clumsinesses that I'm describing today. Um, and it, you know, it was such a relief um, just a few years later uh, when we now moved over to VAXs, because VAXs swap you know, and do page the memory in and out for you when you didn't actually have to sit there programming it. You know, I mean, these are dumb things that you, you, know, that you never want to hear about. Um, and, <laughs> and yet, I'm really hoping that you know, when we come back for the, uh, you know, for the, what, maybe the 50th, 60th you know, anniversaries of NERSC, we'll be um, laughing, again, at, laughing similarly at um, some of the things that we're, you know, the contortions that we're doing in our programming today, in our scientific programming, um, that you know, they were just not the right use for a scientist's time. Um, now, of course, things uh, got much brighter um, uh, in the, uh, I guess it was the end of, uh, of, of 95 um, when uh, Bill McCurdy showed up as the first, you know, the, the first swallow of you know, the Harbinger of Spring, whatever it would be, you know, the first, the first uh, person who, who arrived um, to uh, bring NERSC uh, um, to us at, at, at the time. And uh, I remember when, when he showed up, I think in one of his first weeks here, I, I you know, I, went, I found him after the, the, the end of a, of, of, a, of a work day when he was still in his office and I was still in my office. And I, uh, I, I said to him, you know, I think that this would be a really great thing um, if we could figure out a way to start using some of these computing facilities for some of these cosmology problems that we're working on. And in particular, uh, you know, for the Supernova project, I could think of at least three things, four things, five things, you know, where it would really, really make a difference if we could, uh, if we could just had a little faster you know, uh, computing and little bigger facilities to, to do work. And he was, he was encouraging. Um, and of course, the, you know, it's always dangerous to be encouraging if you're the director of, of anything, because uh, the, you know, I think within a matter of, well, well first I was going to say, within just a matter of, 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 of months or so afterwards, um, there, you know, there were now um, started to be um, some new equipment showing up on the floor, and, and, uh, and, and, and this really dramatic uh, movie star um, <laughs> image, <laughs> of course, show, showing up. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and so there was really something here, but I was going to say the mistake um, was to, to be encouraging because with, you know, within just a, a couple of months, we had put in our first LDRD proposal. This was what they call a quick start proposal um, because as they were moving NERSC in, um, they said, well, why don't we see whether LDRDs, these are the, for those who don't know the terminology, the, these are the, uh, the, the seed money proposals that you can, you can do at, a, at, a, uh, at Berkeley Lab. Um, and, uh, and so we immediately put in a proposal. And what we asked for in this case um, was uh, that we said, well, there's lots of things we'd like to try. But let's, as just one experiment, let's try bringing a, um, a supernova modeler here, one of the few teams in the world um, that does supernova modeling, had a great young uh, uh, student coming out um, who could make a, uh, who, who we'd love to have come as a postdoc. And so within uh, just a matter of months afterwards, um, we had our first postdoc who was able to not only handle data, but also handle theory and, uh, for, for the supernova. And, uh, and so now, uh, I, I don't know if everybody knows, but, P but Peter has just now been advanced to, to a, is it a, a uh, what, what's, what's the exact title called now? Does anyone remember? The, uh, Division deputy. That's right, right. So, a, a, so, so, so uh, you, know, you you figure that, that that's a pretty good start. Um, and uh, and then you know we were very quickly um, using you know as much as we could of anything that was offered to us that included uh, you know analysis capabilities and of course this amazing storage capability, which I think it's worth using just so you can show the slide in your talks. Um, <laughs> it's, it's gorgeous. And then. Um, the, you, you find surprising aspects of the fact that we now had a computing center here that made a huge difference. One of them was the fact that uh, you know, we, were, we got to the point where we were using telescopes all over the world and bringing data back here. 
And uh, there was uh, I, uh, one night in particular I was remembering where the observers at the telescope um, were observing, and we were not getting the data back here. And I was trying to figure out what was going on. This is the very early days of the internet, by the way, um, that, were, that were going on. Um, but at this point, we did have ESNet here. And so I ran downstairs um, to the control room that happened to be here. And I, and I said, can you tell us what's going on? You know, we haven't gotten any data for you know, the last few hours. And we got to see the, you know, and we, we have to finish the analysis tonight because there's another you know, telescope online tomorrow night. We have to know what we have. Um, so they did a little bit of hunting around and came to the conclusion that um, there was a rogue program at Brookhaven over here um, that was just p dumping stuff onto the network and, and clogging the network, um, which apparently you could do at the time. Um, so since we are all powerful um, here at Berkeley, um, the ESNet person said, OK, I'll just take Brookhaven offline. You know, and, <laughs> And instantly, our data started flowing through again. <laughs> and this is from the email from that night uh, that we recently found. Our data started flowing through again at the, at the tremendously normal four kilobytes per second speed. <laughs> and, and, we were, and we were back in business. But um, you know, this gives you a sense of, of what it meant to us to have a, a, you know, these computational facilities right, right here at, at, at the time. Um, of course, you know, it wasn't just us. Um, at, similarly, at that same moment, the other parts of cosmology were really uh, waking up to, uh, to, the, to the need for computation here at, 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 uh, at NERSC. And so Julian Brill was hired um, just about that same time and was starting to work with this new boomerang maxima uh, uh, cosmic microwave background data, um, which then, within just a matter of a year or so after our result, um, was acted as our first confirmation um, that, the, uh, that what we were seeing really was an acceleration of, of the universe. And within you know, uh, just a little while, um, you, were, you were seeing these kinds of things popping up all over the place. So OK, I do need to stop. I, I do want to just leave a happy uh, fourth anniversary in NERSC and uh, looking forward to you know, the next uh, decades um, in which we'll all get to do this again. Um, but I hope with you know, this and the new, uh, new data science possibilities on campus uh, that we'll really be, uh, we'll be doing this you know, in this way that makes what we've done before seem seemed archaic. You know? OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, so we do have time for questions. I, I think this mic is uh, pretty much dead. So <laughs> I'll just ask you to speak up, because there are people uh, listening online. And then we're also recording, uh, so people can watch it later. So here's a question. Um, what do you think of the bicep results and the recent rumors that they didn't properly take into account the uh, So for those of you who, uh, well, first of all, I'll repeat the question. Uh, is what, what, what do we think about the BICEP result? What do I think about the BICEP result? Uh, so this is the BICEP2 collaboration. Um, and I don't know whether everybody is aware uh, that this was uh, it appeared in the front page of the New York Times because um, they were seeing um, what appeared to be the uh, signals that you would expect to see from the very earliest primordial universe, even before the glow of the, of the CMB. So it's a very exciting uh, possibility that you can look back to that early time. There are a number of projects, both here at Berkeley and at other places around the world, that have been working steadily on going uh, more and more sensitive and aiming to get to the sensitivity where you would see such primordial signals that would tell us something about the inflationary epoch of, of the universe. So it's a, a really exciting thing to start with. Now, the particular um, result uh, was, is, is from an excellent team. They, they've made very um, sensitive uh, you know, uh, detectors and, 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 and built a great experiment. Um, they saw it actually at a level of sensitivity that nobody expected that you would see it that easily. Um, they were, they were, everybody thought you'd have to go much, much further down. And uh, it, of course, immediately made everybody start to, to look very closely at what it was that, they, you know, that their measurement consisted of. And at the moment, there's a lot of back and forth over the question of whether what we're seeing is really what they think it is from the, or they hope it would be from the primordial uh, time, or whether we're seeing some foreground noise um, that is not being properly subtracted out or not being completely subtracted out. And this is something I think that if you ask most people in the field today, they would say, this is an easily answerable question, which we will know as soon as we, um, we get the results back from, for example, the upcoming uh, Planck data release, which will be happening this fall. I would say that you, know, you have to call the jury out. At the, you're saying the jury is still out at this moment. Um, but it's, uh, it does focus your attention on 
what an exciting area that will be, you know, assuming we can get to see those. And if we've seen it already, it, it's just going to be tremendous. So I, I think this is working, so. When you plotted your supernova, each, each point, you had two axes. If you could add maybe a third or a fourth parameter to that, what would be your favorite parameter that, that we can, in this audience, understand that would, might help explain all those theories of what's going on with the acceleration process? Well, the, these particular plots I'm showing you are just the history of the expansion of the universe. Um, and so the, they would tell you um, if there is a property of space itself that makes the universe want to uh, you know, expand in, in different ways. But they won't tell you um, how to tell that apart from a change in theories of gravity. So if you were going to get another either axis on a plot, um, I'm not quite sure how you would do this, or at least another plot, you would like to plot how has material, has stuff like galaxies and stars clumped over time in the universe. Because that's very sensitive to whether you have the theory of gravity correct or not. So I think that would be the first thing that you would probably want to do. And the other experiments that we're doing are studying that clumping. And when I say we, I mean the cosmology community. Let me get this one. Um, hi. So um, I don't know if this is on or not. But when you first see the supernova results, you know, you, the first thing you start thinking is, you know, what else could explain this, right? So one possibility might be, say, a time evolution in what we call fundamental constants. But now, you know, it's really exciting to have confirma independent confirmation, like the BAO results and that sort of thing. And if they um, agree so precisely, can you now start to put limits on possible shifts in, say, the, the fine structure constant or the gravitational constant and that sort of thing? Yeah, so uh, maybe just to repeat in case it wasn't clear, the question is um, if there's a possibility that the supernova could change as you go back in time, um, then that might be reflecting a change in some fundamental constants uh, in the universe back then. Conversely, if we see that the, uh, the, the assumption you know, that we're seeing the same behavior back then as today is confirmed by, for example, the barrier and acoustic oscillation results, then can we put limits on how much of the change there is? The answer is yes, there are some papers that people have been uh, trying out. And uh, for certain purposes, it actually does provide a, uh, a rather interesting constraint. Um, the, I don't think it yet gives us a fine structure constant one uh, that I've seen published uh, that's better than the other ones. But I should check that again, because it's a cool question. But absolutely. The other thing I was going to comment about that is that as you get these more and more precise measurements of spectra at great distances, you can, get, you can make the constraints even tighter on individual supernova cases, because you can say this particular supernova out there has all the strain, this exact same evolution um, as it brightens and fades away. All the same things appear and disappear as this one over here. And that can be a very constraining uh, you know, story in terms of the physics has to be running very, very similarly there than here. So I, I'm told that this is working for people online. So, so we do have one. Uh, so online this question. is the age of uh, social media. Ah. So we have a Facebook question. Uh, <laughs> If circumstances permitted a round trip to any celestial body in the universe, where would you go? Ooh. <laughs> wow. Well, I guess, I guess I'm a little bit practical. I think I would first try to go for ones that um, are not at greater than 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit and exploding. So I probably would not visit my favorite supernova. Um, and, but I, but I, I, for, for my money, I, I would probably try to find one of these, uh, these spots that looks you know, as much like, like you know, plants that we know as possible, because it really would be fun if we, you know, eventually we could find some other uh, you know, life forms uh, you know, elsewhere in the universe. And it's probably the only kind of life form that we're going to recognize easily. So it's not necessarily that it's the best place you know, for any kind of life form, but the kind that we would recognize, I think you probably want to look for in a place that looks a little bit like Earth. So maybe that would be my first, my first stop. <laughs> I hope we get lots of stops on this trip. You know. <laughs> so you said in the beginning of the talk that initially the universe was decelerating, but it began to accelerate? Yes. So um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that if you think about that, mo that simple model of the universe, you know, where um, you puff extra space in between galaxies, and it's still infinite, but it just becomes more and more dilute uh, because there's more space between every point. Now play it backwards and s suck the space out, and things get closer and closer and closer together. But one thing that really cares about that is the force of gravity, because now things are closer to each other, and therefore the gravity becomes much, much more important. And as you get back to about 
halfway back to the beginning of the universe, um, you get to the point in which things were close enough to each other that gravity completely out, uh, outweighed you know, any other effect of this possible dark energy. So during that period, the universe did slow down for the first half of its, of its life. OK. I think we have another one. Oh, we have um, could you just quickly describe uh, DAISY and what's new about it? <laughs> oh, uh, DAISY, yes. So the project of measuring the uh, expansion history using the where are galaxies on average, what's the typical distance between galaxies at any given redshift, and then comparing that to the distance between the hot and cold spots you know, in the uh, cosmic microwave background, that project just depends on being able to locate where are all the galaxies. And so what you do is you can easily tell where galaxy is if you can see it you know, on a big telescope um, in, you know, this, in the coordinates across the sky. What's harder is to get the distance, to get the redshift um, direction. There you actually need to get a spectrum of the, of the galaxy. At least today, that's the, uh, the method that you get the precision you need. And the way you do that is by actually uh, trying to take lots and lots of galaxies all at the same time, put a fiber um, a, a, a fiber optic fiber on each one on the focal plane of a telescope, and then bring that down to line them all up on a spectrograph. So now you can do thousands of galaxies spectra all at one time. The problem had been uh, a very difficult manual problem. So a certain you know, human was actually plugging hundreds and hundreds of fibers into a plug plate at the right positions that had been milled ahead of time where galaxies were going to be. And then you take that plate and you put it on a telescope. And that worked for this project called BOSS and for the previous Sloan Digital Sky Survey projects. Um, but when you want to get the scale that we're after and you want to, the, you know, the numbers of galaxies you're after, that's probably not the way to go. So DESI is doing something similar, but with a robotic fiber positioner. So it has about 5,000 fibers, and then it just, uh, you, you, know, you push a button, and the fibers all get sort of slightly rearranged to be where the galaxies will be, and then you observe. And then you push a button on you know, your computer, and they rearrange again to where uh, the next set of galaxies are as you move over on the sky. And that way, you can be much more efficient at getting many more thousands of, of galaxies' positions. So that project is called DESI. And it's uh, aimed at, at, at the moment, it's designed for the four meter mile telescope on Kitt Peak um, that would be then be taken over for this, this purpose. Uh, I'm wondering whether you have considered ever the time-space deformation and how it can affect the the results. Say again, so the time space? Deformation, deformation. or pulsation of, of the time space, or whatever, oh, like oh, uh, whether changes the, of the time whether, space. Whether the, whether the time space could be doing some sort of local deformations. You know, um, now, there's certain kinds of deformations that are just nowadays uh, considered normal. <laughs> um, so you know, the fact that light bends um, because space can be thought of as being deformed as, it goes, uh, as you're going around a very heavy object like a star, um, or a galaxy, or a cluster of galaxies. Um, that is something that is now just put into all the calculations, and we include that in as, as a matter of course. And so you have to average you know, uh, your, your measurements over all the different kinds of, of effects that you, that you infer of that kind. Um, there's, you know, there's some error bars that come in, because you don't necessarily know exactly um, which you know, massive stars the, uh, or massive clusters or galaxies, um, the, the rays of light have, have gone by. Um, so, but that is part of the standard um, story. Now, there are other, you know, you know, among the huge number of, what, there's thousands of theories that, that I was showing you, there's papers flying in. Um, there are theories that try other kinds of deformation of space in rather unusual ways. So far, I'd say we don't have any strong evidence for, for particularly bizarre ones uh, other, you know, than, than the ones that we've already been uh, putting in these calculations. But it's constantly being asked. I mean, people are always looking at you know, different ways in which you could be having a theory where gravity would work in a different way um, to change the dynamics of the space time that you're seeing. I have a question about uh, how do you tell the difference between redshift from an object that's accelerating away from you, like a light source, or redshift caused by the expansion of space time itself? The problem um, actually is one that, for certain parts of the, of the measurement, is actually a serious problem that you can't tell apart just by observation um, in a, you know, when it's very, when the, particularly when they're nearby. So in the nearby expanding universe, um, the expansion hasn't had a chance to make that much of a difference you know, in, in terms of the redshift of things. So it's very comparable to the amount of Doppler shift that you get because 
galaxies are orbiting around you know, us and around each other and locally. Um, and so there, in the relatively nearby universe, now you know, this is not nearby by any of our ordinary conventional standards, only nearby compared to the billions of light years you know, that, you're, that you're working with. Uh, but in, the, in that relatively nearby universe, um, you have to put in different models and try to fit um, what you expect this rotations and, and, and things to be. Um, and you, it adds all sorts of uncertainties. The, the measurements I was showing you, though, are almost all well out beyond so that the expansion of the universe is so much of a bigger effect than this little peculiar velocities, which are only on the order of a few you know, hundreds of kilometers per second, then you, you, can, you can treat this as, as negligible for those problems. Okay, was it better? So uh, I have one question about your discovery story. So you mentioned before you spent one year to change your hypothesis or say hy hypothesis of your uh, or experiment, yeah? Your I'm sorry, work. you spent one year what? At the beginning, yeah. or the, at the beginning of the, all your, your research, yeah. you assume this is a slow down expansion, not accelerate. Yes. And then, because you have uh, many curves in that uh, plot. So at that time, did you have this survey with all the uh, like, uh, curves? And then you have the data, yeah? You say, OK, now I change the, I, I have new discovery. So, and then the other question is, uh, so, uh, okay, let me re repeat. <laughs> right. So, because based on that figure, you have different surveys, like a slowdown or a bigger crunch or this accelerated, yeah? And then you put the data in, and then you say, okay, now I got the di new discovery, yeah? Well, of so, course, at, at, at the time, right, the, the, most of the lines that we were considering were all lines that had different degrees of slowing. Um, and it was when the data missed all those lines that we, we then started to take a little more seriously the fact that, well, we know about other lines um, that we could have put on. And then we started drawing the other lines that slowed and then ex 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 okay. accelerated. Is that, is that part of the answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. that's a part. And yeah. the other question is, did you feel the competition from the other group at that time during that the year? year? Yes, I mean, we, it, was, it was definitely this, this you know, this, uh, you know, fierce rivalry, you know, we were, you know, r racing at that point. Uh, you know, once we had gotten to the point where we were finding large numbers of distant supernova, um, the other team, which had been mostly at that point focusing on relatively nearby supernova studies, they joined in this game and they started trying to find these very distant supernova. And towards the end, you know, they were finding them and we were finding them. We'd be passing each other at the telescopes because we have to use the same telescopes. There are only some telescopes in the world that, <laughs> you know, that, that could do the job. So you know, we, we would, uh, you know, we, we, we'd be you know, heading out while they were coming in or vice versa, you know, wave to each other at the airports. You know, um, <laughs> and, uh, but you know, generally, people were doing this you know, very much you know, in, without telling each other you know, what we were seeing most of the time. Now, um, it is true that we, you know, if anybody understood how difficult a project it was, it was the guys on the other team, um, and guys and gals on the other team. And so there'd be times where, you know, uh, one of the teams would have a, 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 a bad night. The, the telescope, the, the, uh, you know, the clouds would come in and would ruin a key night that that whole carefully timed sequence had to happen or else everything would be wasted. And so there were times when we would trade with each other a night to help the other team uh, you know, stay, stay on, on target. Or uh, you know, there's one occasion where we took observations for the other team of one of the supernovae they had found because otherwise it would get lost, um, and we you know, we got that data for them. But those were a little bit more the you know the friendly exceptions to this to the uh, to the you know the fierce rule you know, and uh, and so you know at the time when we were coming up with these final results, um, neither you know we certainly did not know and they didn't know you know that we were seeing these these same sorts of things until we started announcing them at, at conferences. My question is related to, I mean, we, we know that cosmic microwave background radiation was one of the sources of new information about the universe. Supernovas are another source. And I'm wondering now what astronomical objects or physical processes would be probably the next breakthrough in physics and our understanding of the universe? There are several that seem, are waiting in the wings that we think, uh, you know, so far now we have, you know, CMB, supernova, and I just talking about the baryon acoustic oscillation technique, you know, this one that Boss and Desi uh, do. Um, but now they're, the next ones that we're hoping have a chance um, include ones called weak gravitational lensing. And the idea is that distant galaxies, um, if you look at their light 
as it travels to us, um, it will get distorted in its, in its path to us by the gravitational lensing effect of all the intervening matter between us and them. So that the more clumping there is in between us and the distant galaxy, um, the more you'll, you'll have bent the light and you'll have distorted that shape of the galaxy that you see in the distance. It's a very subtle distortion um, so that any one, and, and any given galaxy, um, of course, has a weird shape anyway. So any one galaxy you never know. However, statistically, if you look at millions of galaxies, you can see this subtle distortion um, and it can tell you where the mass is clumping in the universe, which helps make the plot that you were asking about before of what's the history of the clumping. That then tells us about the possibility that Einstein's theory of gravity needs modification. So that one, um, there's a new ground-based telescope that's being built um, called the Large Synaptic Survey Telescope, LSST. Um, and that one we're expecting uh, will be you know, built and ready by the end of this decade. Um, there is a new space-based project uh, called Euclid that the Europeans are making, which is aimed at that one as well. And then this WFIRST project I was talking about also um, is, is aimed at that. So that one I think has a real fighting chance that we'll, get, we'll, we'll at least get to try it or we'll find out you know, um, it, you know, wh where the problems are with it if, if, you know, as, as we do it. So that one is the first. And then people are also um, just trying to see where the um, clusters appear in the universe. So there are a number of projects now that are just trying to identify the clusters of galaxies. And the cluster ring itself is very much uh, a, a test of the of gravitational changes in, in the theories of gravity. And so these cluster studies, uh, for example, even the, this current project, the Dark Energy Survey, DES, um, is uh, going to be uh, finding very many clusters. And we hope making a systematic study of how that, those clusters evolve. But uh, those um, have both those techniques so far. Um, we haven't yet been able to bring them online uh, because there's a lot of systematic uncertainties that you have to figure out how to control um, if you're going to be able to, to use them. And so those are two very promising ones, but we're waiting to see them actually come into their full, you know, full force. So there's a whole universe of different challenges and problems that you and your team could have gone after uh, addressing systematically. I imagine that along the way, you ran into some pretty big hurdles with this one. Data that didn't make sense, models that weren't working, funding cycles, so on. So what convinced you to persist with this particular set of challenges as opposed to moving on to something else? Yeah, no, it's a very good question, because this um, was a project that, you know, at, at, many moments looked like it was just not going to succeed. Um, there were lots of times where uh, you know, we thought, and you know, any ordinary uh, you know, funding cycle would have decided, OK, you know, we tried that one for a few years, done. You know. um, we were very uh, fortunate, I think, in this case, that a national laboratory um, has the possibility of doing this longer term you know, thinking and, and actually allowing something to proceed. Um, and uh, in, in my particular case, um, we had Bob Kahn here, um, who is the division director, who was willing to hold off the pressures from, uh, from Washington, saying, uh, why are you doing that project? You know, um, and, uh, and, and was able to let us, let us pr pr pursue it. Um, but your question also asks, why would we want to keep going uh, when, it, when, it was, you know, when we went through you know, what, three years without finding a supernova, and then you know, five years we had one, you know, that's not enough to make this measurement. And um, why would you keep going on it? And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that it seemed like a really great question. The, the thing that you were getting to measure was one that seemed like, you know, what could be better than measuring the fate of the universe and whether the universe is infinite or finite? I mean, it just seemed like that was a wonderful measurement to be able to get at. And the fact that it's at every moment while we were doing it, you, you, could, you could just sort of taste how close it was for us to be able to get there. That you know, all you need to do was something that was very practical. It wasn't like you had to invent something dramatic. You just had to figure out how to get those little bright supernova to be found, you know, uh, well, faint supernova to be discovered and, and managed to get them into your telescopes and managed to be able to observe them enough. It just seemed like almost an organizational problem at any, given, at any given stage. Now, of course, there were a lot of technical hurdles that we had to figure out along the way. Um, and each step, you learned more. But it did have that sense that this is, you know, it's just, you know, if, if we don't do it, somebody's got to do it. You know, it, it had that feel. So. Uh... So we'll just uh, close with this. You probably get this uh, question a lot. This is also from, uh, uh, from Facebook. It's from Diego Sandoval. As a physicist in training, what is your advice to someone like me? Ah. <laughs> 
Well, I think maybe the, the two themes maybe coming out of this talk here uh, are very appropriate. Uh, one is from the, in, in the biggest picture, it's the answer to your question. If you can find problems and look for problems that you really would love to work on even when things go wrong. Um, and that you would love to keep on working on even when the second thing is goes wrong. And, you know, and then after four years, you would still love to work on it. You know, if you can find that kind of problem, you know, th th that's you know, absolutely you know, a, a wonderful thing to, to uh, do. Now, you know, th that there's some luck. I felt really lucky when the time came that we had that problem to work on. Um, and you know, you, maybe you can find a problem that you just really enjoy the steps along the way. And that, too, is a, a, a big part of it. So that's the first uh, most important one. And then, in my mind, this, the second one um, is just, given everything we've been saying today, um, just practically speaking, get really good on the computer. <laughs> 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 but I think that's a great ending. So, so thank, thank you very much.